Have we not known? Have we not heard? Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We'll have our opening hymn, Heart of Worship. Call to confession. We fool ourselves if we think that our ways are hidden from God. Therefore, let us confess our sin, trusting in the mercy of God our Maker. God, you are everlasting, the creator of all that is. Your understanding is beyond measure. We confess to you that we have sinned against you, our neighbors. Is your confession forgive us? Our hope, love. Amen. Our declaration of forgiveness. Praise the Lord. Our God heals the broken hearted and binds up our wounds. God take pleasure in those who place their trust in God's grace. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
How you guys doing? Good? Having a good day? If you had something really, really, really important to say to somebody else, how could you, how could you tell them it was really, really important? Is there, is there maybe a different way you would speak? You, you could stand up. Very good, Rosie. you maybe raise your voice? Like if you really, really, really wanted somebody to pay attention to you? Or could you maybe emphasize particular words? You know, like if you were asking your parents for something, say, please, 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 please. You, 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 you don't do that though, right? No, no. What, what, what about if it's something really exciting, like really happy news, like you got a uh, Maybe you got an A on a paper in school, or you got a special gift that you weren't looking for. Would you maybe talk really, really fast and really excited and say, hey, hey, pay attention to me. Look, look, listen to me, listen to me. Would, would any of you speak like that, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I bet so. Because when we get excited, we can't keep it in, can we? We just have to tell somebody. We have to say, hey, hey, guess what? Guess what? Guess what's going on? The really great news is, with God, one of the things God always asks us to do is to tell other people about God and about Jesus and about the great things that God does. And the even greater thing is, we can tell other people those things in the same kind of way. We can be really excited. Do you think anybody would want to come to church if we said, can I tell you about Jesus? And does that just, does that make you want to get up and come to church? I tell you about this guy, Jesus. Do you, do, you, do you really want to come? Probably not. But if you're saying things like, hey, do you know, about, do you know this story about Jesus? You know, there's, there's this story that Jesus went and healed one of his disciples' mothers-in-law. She was sick, and Jesus went to him, and she healed him and made him all better. In fact, that's the story that we're all going to read here in just a minute from the Gospel of Mark. It's a very exciting thing, and it gets people really, really excited about God. So before you guys go to the back to see Miss Katie back there with your treats, let's say a prayer to God. Dear God, thank you for giving us stories that we can be excited to tell. Give us the excitement to tell others about you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, see you guys next Sunday. Holy God, speak to us what has been told from the beginning, your word that is the foundation of the world. Amen. And as we come to our reading in Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 29, I will read the first paragraph. You, the congregation, will read the second paragraph, and then I will conclude with the third paragraph. And as we just said to the children, let us read not dully 
or boringly, but let us read with a word of excitement and a word of hope that we find in these pages, in this story of our Lord Jesus Christ. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone's looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And now we turn to page 957 to Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth, to chapter 9, beginning in verse 16. Listen again for God's word. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward, that in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel? For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. This is the word of God. We've almost completely come through this season of epiphany. We recall the revelation of Christ to the world, that Christ was revealed to the world. That is why we've left up our nativity scene, not taken it down the Sunday after epiphany. Through the texts we've read, the worship we've shared, the encounters we've had these past weeks, we've seen that Christ is revealed not in secret or to a certain special people, but to everyone in the midst of everybody in community. And likewise, we respond in the midst of community as we come together as the church in and for this world. And through this, we see Christ in one another, in the things that we do and the things that we say, in doing and being. We are Christ. This is an important point. Because even though there are different stories and different encounters, it is the same revelation because it is the same Jesus that is revealed in all of it. Today, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, we hear of two competing demands, and through them, we also see that Christ is revealed, revealed in us, in our actions, what we as the church do. So the things that we do, the things that we say, they really matter. We see the question of what to do and how to do it. Now, this discussion grows out of one that Paul began at the beginning of chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, where these people in Corinth said that we understand the food that is sacrificed to idols is really sacrificed to nothing because they don't exist. So can we eat this food if we buy it in the market? In that discussion, as well as this one, Paul notes it is possible, even quite easy, to get our theology right but to get our practice, our ministry, our witness to the world totally wrong. So first, to the what to do, found in verses 16 through 18. Parker Palmer, an educator and Christian author, notes that our vocation, that is, what we are called by God to do, 
to worship God, to love God, to give glory to God, ought to be the thing that we can't not do. Now, it's jarring to hear that. We don't speak with double negatives. Our English teachers cringe if we say can't not. Just don't do it in English. But it's totally in keeping with the way other languages speak. It's totally in keeping with the way the Gospels are written, where they use double, triple, quadruple negatives to emphasize the impossibility of doing something. Our calling from God ought to be the thing that we are compelled to do, the thing we can't help but do. Viktor Frankl calls vocation the intersection of our deep passion with the world's deep need. Jeremiah the prophet in chapter 20, verse 9 of the book bearing his name, describes vocation and his vocation in particular as a prophet as a fire in the bones, something that is inescapable, something that drives everything we do. And that is where Paul begins, with the inability for him to do anything else. He has the right but he's unable to do anything else. What is your great passion? Where does that meet the world's great need? What is it that you can't not do? And how, in your doing of it, do you serve God in it? Paul speaks of obligation, not in a sense like he signed a contract or entered into an agreement or made a personal choice because we know those can always be reversed. We can always back out of those. No, he describes that with God there really is no choice, only call and response, only our taking on a role of a servant or a slave that is entrusted with a responsibility. Now today, in a few moments, we will ordain and install leaders of, in our congregation into service. In the same way, we understand them to be commissioned, that God has called them to the voice of this church, not to be our representatives, not to be the ones that do what we think we ought to do, but that they should listen for the voice of God and do and be the people God has called them to be for this church. Now, some of us that will not be up here in a few moments might be thinking, better them than me. But really, every single one of us, whether we are called into a particular form of leadership in the church or whether we are just called to be a part of the church, we are called by God. We are compelled, quite simply, the things we do in service, in worship, in coming together as God's people, we do them because it's what the people of God do. There is no choosing another path. It's this or nothing. It's what Francis of Assisi understood, I think, when he said, in all things, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. Francis noted, in everything we do, when we go out into the world, when we claim Christ as our Lord and Savior, everything we do, everything we say, reflects on the one we call God. So in all that we do, we are proclaiming the gospel. We are preaching the gospel. But what gospel are we proclaiming? Are we doing it in word and deed? Are we doing it far and wide? Are we doing it now and always? Are we doing it following the lead and example of Jesus? Now, all of this isn't really anything new. It's not anything we've not heard before. It's something that more or less, whether we like it or not, we can all pretty well agree on this is what we all, we all have a call. We all have a call to represent and to glorify God in our world. But it's the how of it, the how to live this out that has always been the sticking point with people. It's been the controversy and the hard part. Paul speaks to this in verses 19 and 23, noting that once he's given up the right to reward, that is in his idea, the right to be paid or compensated for the work he does, that he is free to serve on the terms of other people, that the proclamation he makes, that the service he gives is about meeting others on their terms, on their turf, on their level. In this way, being all things to all people is not about being somebody that we're not. It's not about adopting a fake personality. It's about speaking to others in a way that they understand. About meeting them where they are, rather than expecting them to come and be the way we think they ought to be. That they need to think the way we think. That they need to act the way we act. It's about identifying with other people on a deep level where we speak with others 
rather than speaking to them, or even worse, speaking down to them. The church historically and even now is pretty good at speaking to people and even speaking down to people, but that is not our call. The idea is Paul's inability to do anything else is that he values relationships with people over and above his own rights and freedoms. It's about not being a stumbling block to the gospel, about giving people a reason to say, no, not for me. It's about finding common ground with others, about being humble servants rather than privileged, stuck-up, self-righteous know-it-alls. It's about accepting others where we find them, not requiring them to be where we want them to be. Because the great thing is, in hearing and responding to the gospel, to that call of God to us, is that it's about being where God wants us to be, not where we think we ought to be, not where we think others ought to be, but about together being where God wants us to be. Responsibilities and rights really is about Paul's exercise and example of responsible freedom. Now, we as the church, we are called to be different in the world. We're to be unique, distinct, set apart. We're to present an alternative. Now, in the United States, we're all about freedom, especially personal, individual freedom. Now, as an idea, the writers of the Bible, that would have been as strange a notion to them as a lot of their customs and expectations are to us. In the ancient world, rights and responsibilities existed. People had them, but it was always held in tension with responsibility for the care and nurture of other people. So what could stand out more? What could speak to what is different and unique about the church, about those of us that claim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, than the recognition that we have rights and freedoms, but the refusal to make an idol of them. Because when we make them the chief thing in life, when we emphasize them above everything else, we put them in the place that only God ought to occupy. Paul affirms rights. Paul spends verse after verse after verse saying, yes, I have the right. Saying yes to these Corinthians. Yes, your theology is right. You have a right understanding. But Paul says it's for nothing if we value ourselves and our rights over our relationship with others. If we value what we can do and what we're entitled to more than meeting the needs of others and allowing others to meet our needs. Because again, another thing that really defines us is self-sufficiency. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul describes a church as being a group of people that bear one another's burdens. Well, we can't bear other people's burdens if we're not with them, if we're not doing life together with them. Likewise, they cannot bear our burdens if we hold on to them and cling to them and hoard them to ourselves. These are words that Paul gives to the church for all times, especially in times of conflict and disagreement. He makes a case for forbearance, for freedom of conscience, one of the great ideals of our Presbyterian church, the idea that we are made stronger because we do not think all alike, act alike, value alike, worship alike. We are united in the one thing that matters, that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And because we agree on that, because we come together under that same Lord, all of that other stuff doesn't matter. We can say, you don't have to think like me. You don't have to act like me. Because historically and even nowadays, when the church does not agree, the world can think about what that leads to. It leads to historically the most destructive, violent wars humanity has ever known. They've been about tearing one another down. They've been about casting out other people just because they don't believe, act, or think the way we do. What a witness to the world. What a different witness. What a, dare I say, gospel witness. When in the midst of conflict and disagreement, we value relationship and belonging and unity over division, hatred, and petty bickering. Paul begins by noting that he gives up his reward. But note, at the end, Paul recognizes that he can't escape an even greater reward, that of the blessing of the gospel, found not in clinging to it, not in hoarding to it, not found in keeping it from others, but found only 
in giving it away, in sharing it with other people, with others, a sharing that comes out of what Paul can't not do. So what is it that God has put on you in your life, in the circumstances of your life, that you can't not do? What freedom do you have that you can tap into that frees you to serve others as Christ leads? Leading as one who came to serve, not to be served. Because this is what the gospel is all about. This is the good news. This is the hope. Do the thing you can't not do. And do it for God's glory. In baptism, Lori, Vicki, Susie, Eunice, Penny, Glenn, and Deb were clothed in Christ and are now called by God through the voice of the church to enter into ministries of service and governance, announcing in word and deed the good news of Jesus Christ. We remember with joy our common calling to serve Christ as we celebrate God's particular call to our sisters and brothers. You may be seated at this time. From a little later in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, in chapter 12, verses 4 through 7 and 27, there are varieties of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Listen now to this statement on service in our church. We are called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by his Holy Spirit. This is our common calling, to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as ruling elders, as ministers of the word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for the ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church, and preaching the word and administering the sacraments. Representing the one holy Catholic and apostolic church the session of the First Presbyterian Church now ordains Vicki Berry to the Office of Deacon and Lori Cunnington to the Office of Ruling Elder and installs them to active service on their respective boards. The session also installs to active service those who have been previously ordained, Deacons Susie Trauber and Deb Wood and Ruling Elders Penny Larson, Eunice DeCourcy and Glenn Berry. To all of you, I now ask the constitutional questions of office. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, acknowledge him as Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, please say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal, and God's word to you. If so, please say, I do. I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, please say, I do. I do. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture be continually guided by our confessions? If so, please say, I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, please say, I will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, please say, I will. Do you promise to further the peace, peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, please say, I do. Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, please say, I will. To Penny, Eunice, Glenn, and Lori, will you be a faithful ruling elder, 
watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service. Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will. To Susie, Deb, and Vicki, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will. These questions are for the congregation. Do we, the members of the church, accept Penny Larson, Eunice DeCourcy, Glenn Berry, Lori Cunnington, Susie Trauber, Deb Wood, and Vicki Berry as ruling elders and deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Please respond, we do. Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? Please respond, we do. This time, uh, Vicki, I will ask you to take a seat, and Lori, if you are able to kneel beside Vicki. Those of you that are to be installed, but are previously ordained, I ask you to form a circle around Lori and Vicki. And any that are here and are willing that our current or former ruling elders or deacons, you are invited to come forward as we pray over this new class and ordain and install them. pray in the ancient manner through the laying on of hands of those that God has called into service for the church of God. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you all thanks and praise. Throughout the ages you have been faithful to your covenant people whom you have called out of bondage and redeemed to be your own. In every time and place you have chosen servants from among your people to point the way to salvation. We are grateful for ancestors in the faith who followed without fear, placing their trust in you alone. We give you thanks for judges and monarchs who ruled in righteousness and peace. We praise you for prophets and apostles who spoke your bold words of mercy and truth. We thank you for men and women of every age who have nurtured your people in faith and faithfulness. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all he said and did. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon your servants, whom you have called through baptism as your own and marked as your own. Grant them the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Give them a spirit of truthfulness, that they may show the compassion of Christ in the actions of daily living and rightly govern your people. Give them the gifts of your Holy Spirit to build up the church to strengthen to common life of your people, and to lead with compassion and vision. In the walk of faith and for the walk, work of ministry, give to your servants gladness and strength, discipline and hope, humility, humor, and courage, and an abiding sense of your presence. Gracious God, pour out your spirit of power and truth upon the whole church, that we may be for you a holy people, baptized to serve you in the world. Sustain this congregation in ministry, ground us in the gospel, secure our hope in Christ, 
strengthen our service to the outcast, and increase our love for one another. Show us the transforming power of your grace in our lives together, that we may be servants of the gospel, offering a compelling witness in the world to the good news of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Penny Larson, Eunice DeCourcy, Glenn Berry, Lori Cunnington, Susie Trauber, Deb Wood, and Vicki Berry. You are now deacons and ruling elders in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Lord. Welcome to your act of service, and as Paul once wrote to Timothy, do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. Congratulations. Some Sundays we have not much to pray for, but some Sundays we have much to pray for. With all of these things on our minds and in our hearts, let us pray to God. God of the universe, you sit above the circle of the earth, and so we pray for the oceans and mountains, inland water and the air we breathe. Save and protect them, we pray. Since the beginning of our faith, you have looked, we have looked to you to gather the outcasts, heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. So we pray for the poor of the world, the sick and the lonely. God, you who built up Jerusalem, to you we pray for our country and for all countries of the world and for all our leaders, local, national, and global. May we come to see that your delight is in peace, not in war, that your strength is in mercy, not in might that we continue to hope in your steadfast love above all. How good it is to sing our praises to you, O oh God. We pray for your church here and around the world. Empower us to go from town to town proclaiming the saving message of Jesus Christ. For the many concerns, for the many names and situations that we have put forth to you, and even for those that are known to you but not given voice by us, hear and answer all in your wisdom. Everlasting God, creator of the ends of the earth, we bless you for you are gracious. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours now and forever. And hear us now as we pray as one, praying the way Jesus taught us, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 